example. Versus something called reduced frequency. And reduced frequency is like frequency. It's like my loading it fast or loading it <coughs> slow. And what we find is that if I load this material, this asphalt concrete, quickly, it responds stiffly. Just like when I bounce this rubber ball. Or, excuse me, silly button. But if you load it slowly, it responds with a relatively low modulus. Okay? So at low temperature or very fast frequencies, asphalt concrete is very much like uh, concrete, Portland cement concrete. But at a low rate or a high temperature, like we have here in Phoenix, it may respond more like rubber, very soft material. And so we have to take this behavior into account through the constitutive relationship between stress and strain. So the second part of that relationship, so this is about setting this initial state, this no damage, what's the baseline behavior of our material. And then we start looking at what is the behavior, this equation that relates our damaged state now to this reduced state. And this, all these little micro cracks turn out to be related and we relate them through the math to a parameter we call S which you can think of as damage. So if you want to put this plot into something other than C versus S, you can think of this as damage, microcracking, versus the effect on the effective or apparent stiffness of the material. It's a very simple concept. As I load the material under fatigue, I create microcracks which lower the stiffness of my asphalt concrete, and this is the relationship between that stiffness and the damage. And it turns out, because we're looking at the fundamental characteristics of the material, it turns out that this relationship doesn't depend on things like frequency, and it doesn't depend on things like temperature. It's just what the material wants to do. It's the typical behavior of the material itself. So, if you look at all of the series in this graph, we have constant rate test, this monotonic. What was done is we took a sample, pretend that this is asphalt concrete, and we just pulled it at a constant rate. Then we took another sample and we ran a fatigue test. We, we loaded it back and forth several times. And we get, because we're looking at the fundamental characteristics, we get the same curve for those two tests. Because the material doesn't care that it's being cycled. It doesn't care that it's being uh, pulled apart. It just knows when I have this much damage, the effect on my modulus is so much. So that's what we're actually doing with these kind of constitutive material models. And the power of that can be seen when we look at a typical strain prediction. So here, now these are a bunch of tests that were run. Uh, we have number of cycles on the x-axis, strain amplitude on the y-axis. And you see measurements and predictions. Now, the, the key to all of this is that curve is the same regardless of my conditions. So what's done? is take a condition and get that characteristic relationship and then use that with the equations I have, that constitutive law, and predict everything else. So these, all these little dashes here came from running one test at this condition. Everything else was predicted. That's the, the power of a constitutive-like relationship. Now putting it in a different way, if we look at what it takes to do all of those points with a conventional approach where we're going to be looking at temperature effects because remember asphalt concrete is linear viscoelastic we're looking at different amplitudes we're looking at different types of mode of loading whether we, whether we load it with a constant displacement or a constant force every time and then we replicate that total time to do that and generate all those points might be two months On the the, the other approach, which is to use this kind of a mathematical approach where we limit our number of tests because we're getting at the fundamental characteristic, we reduce that time down to something like three days. Now, how does this actually get applied in practice? Well, there are two ways. One, an agency or, or whomever may say, great, I don't need to do two months worth of testing. Another way to look at it is I've gathered all of the information I could typically gather in two months in three days. So now I'm going to take the next month and a half and look at other behaviors of the material that I might not have been able to consider given the time constraints that you have in engineering practice.
You can do other things with this. So, for example, we might look at something at different types of materials. New materials, for example. Uh, here we're talking about sustainable materials. So in pavement field, there are two types of materials that we generally think about as being environmentally friendly. One of the materials uses a lower temperature to produce asphalt concrete. We call those warm mix asphalt concrete material. So that's what was demonstrated here on this side. Now it turns out that when you do that, you're changing some of the surface chemistry internal of the asphalt concrete <coughs> mixture. And the side effect of that is that in the presence of moisture, the material may be more prone to damage. And that's captured through the modeling effort to find out that in this case, we had about 20% difference in a hot mix or a standard type of material, whereas we get 70 to 80% in terms of a warm mix. Again, looking at the internal behaviors of the material. Now, the other approach to finding environmental materials are recycled asphalt pavement. So what's done is to go out in the field and you would mill up an old pavement and then you reintroduce that into your new asphalt concrete. What happens when you do that is that you're introducing a material that's been exposed to sunlight, it's been exposed to oxygen, and its behavior has become stiff and brittle. And now you're mixing this stiff, brittle material with some kind of uh, un- aged or, or new material that's fresh, if you want to think about it that way. And there's this interaction that happens, and we can characterize how that occurs by looking at, again, the fundamental characteristics. In this case, what we found is, even though the materials were uh, maybe lower cost to the environment at the outset, because we're including re recycled materials, in the long term, because of that embrittlement, we lose performance over time. And that means that when we actually consider these materials, we don't need to be looking at just the initial first environmental cost, but then longer term, what are the impacts of that in a broader uh, context. So another area that's, that's prevalent, so I said, mentioned rutting and I mentioned fatigue, but we also have thermal cracking. In, in Arizona, it's not as big of a problem, but you can imagine somewhere like Minnesota, where the temperatures get down very, very low, and you develop these thermal cracks in the pavement system. Thermal cracks generally run transverse to the travel direction. They're very small, but they occur and they're a primary source of failure in some location. Now the typical procedure for considering this effect would be to run something called a TSRST test. I can never remember what TSRST stands for. Uh, it's something like Thermal Stress Restrained Specimen Test. I don't know, whoever came up, pavement engineers aren't that creative when it comes to naming stuff. <laughs> but basically what you do is you put this sample in the machine, and you hold it, and then you start cooling it down. Now, as you cool any material, its tendency is to shrink. But this particular test holds it in place, and it lets stresses, internal stresses develop, because it's wanting to shrink, but it can't. And over time, if you do that long enough, this sample eventually just fractures right in the because the material, again, the material doesn't care if the stresses are induced by thermal effects or by mechanical effects, I mean bending them. The material doesn't care. It's just going to follow its constitutive law. And by characterizing that behavior, what you're able to do is actually predict how this material deforms or behaves in a completely different kind of loading than was used to look at characterizing it. Now, all this sounds really good. The problem turns out that many of, the, many of these phenomena that this, this micro-cracking is capturing occur in volumes of the material that aren't representative of the whole macro sample. So when we do these constitutive models at the macro level, we make several simplifying assumptions. One of the big assumptions is that the material is homogeneous and uniform. Now obviously asphalt concrete is not homogeneous and uniform, but you can see from the previous slides that making that assumption, I can still do some pretty powerful stuff in terms of my predictions of the material behavior. But when we look at other phenomena that are, occur and are important, like infiltration of moisture, eroding the bond between the asphalt binder and the aggregates, or oxidative aging as it diffuses through these films and into the bodies, or even that, that uh, highly detailed surface chemistry effect between a wrap 
coated material and a non-wrap coated material. All of these things turn out to be related to scales that are much smaller than you can consider in the decision model. And what that means is we can't get at, from these models, we can't get at the uh, physical uh, equations that drive the process. So we have to look at different scales to match the scales of our deformation. Now this particular image is actually internal of an asphalt concrete sample as it was failing. And you can see that we're not breaking rocks in this thing. We're actually deforming and breaking the asphalt film itself. So how do we link these behaviors across the material link scales? Well, first of all, what are material link scales are we dealing with? And that's uh, in this work, we're primarily focusing in on this middle ring, this asphalt binder to asphalt mix. And in order to make the link, people have tried, I mentioned very early, there have been two camps, binder folks, mix folks. And people have tried to make this link before for several years using an even number of techniques. And it turns out that they've all failed. So what we're going to try to do is actually do an intermediate step or two to make these links. And the only thing that differs between each step is the size of particles we start to put into the material. So in the case of mastic, we're dealing with particles smaller than 0.075. It's a number 200 sieve, if you're, if you're familiar with the sieve size and standard. Uh, FAM, fine aggregate matrix, it's very similar to what you think of as mortar, if you're talking about Portland cement concrete. It has sand-sized particles in it, and then all the way to the mix. So we're linking these three scales. And in this process of doing this kind of investigation, there are three basic questions we ask ourselves. The first is how do those different scales, the mastic, the fam, how do they exist within their asphalt concrete body? Where do they exist? Are they homogeneously distributed throughout the medium? Uh, are, they, are they in pockets, perhaps? How does that distribute? We have to answer that question. Then we have to find out how do these individual phases, this mix, fam, and now binder, how do those phases behave? What are the constitutive relationships for each of the phases? And then, once you know how each one behaves individually, how do they all behave together and give us what we actually observe in our macro scale studies? So we've got to answer all of these questions. And it turns out that what I'm going to do today is just kind of show you a taste of each of these, a little, little bit. So when we look at asphalt concrete, many times what we see is black covered aggregate. It looks black, but when you actually remove the asphalt binder, you find that these aggregate particles are actually coated in a blanket of fine aggregates and filler particles. And it kind of shows up here as this knobby looking rocks. These are the actual aggregate particles, but they have this coating of fine materials. And if you break it apart, what you find is that the sizes are well distributed and follow what we see from the normal uh, gradation analysis in our inputs. Now when you look at asphalt mastic, so first let's look at a, a mixed sample that's failed. So here I've taken an asphalt concrete and pulled it apart. And if you take that, slice it up and put it underneath an electron microscope and start looking at the surface, what you find is that you get this area of fracture where the filler particles exist. In other words, fracture or failure is happening in these films of asphalt mass. We kind of saw that in the other slide where it showed the failure happening in, not in an aggregate itself, but more in the films behind it. And so what you could do is make qualitative assessments. You start looking at, this is the asphalt mix sample. Let's look at a mastic prepared with one filler concentration, another filler concentration, and another, and just make qualitative judgment calls. Well, I kind of think this material here looks a little bit like this, and so forth. It's not qualitative. It's not necessarily very scientific, but it's a good start on learning how the materials are distributed within the body. We take it a step further by taking these asphalt concrete samples and extracting carefully sub or meso volumes of the material. And again, what we're going to do is take them, uh, figure out how much asphalt we have in them, look at the uh, particle gradation using the scanning electron microscope technique. So we'll take these images and we get, this is the, the particles in that sub volume, and we can image this and get to the particle size distribution.